Welcome to Water of Life Online. We are so glad that you are tuning in for today's message. And you know, here at Water of Life, we believe in having passion for God and compassion for people. And so we're so glad that you're with us today. For more information about our church, from our service times, to the ministries we have available and more, you can check out our website at wateroflifecc.org. And of course, if you wanna stay connected with us throughout the week, make sure you follow us on our different social media platforms. Well, we're so glad that you're here. We hope that God speaks to you, that he encourages you, and we hope that you are blessed by today's message. Good morning, Water of Life. For those of you that are upland around the world, welcome. My name is Shane, and I'm one of the teaching pastors here. And um, <clears throat> We're gonna stop this morning just before we get into the message. We're gonna pick up our perspective series in part four today, but if you've been watching the news, you know there's some things that have been happening around the world, first in Israel and also in Afghanistan, and we wanna stop this morning and recognize a couple of those things. Second Chronicles tells us um, Solomon is uh, sharing a word from the Lord and being told a word that if they would, people would turn from their wicked ways and they would turn their hearts and their minds and turn away from their sin, that God would heal their land. And we know that we need the Lord to heal Israel right now. <clears throat> and uh, if you're not aware, Afghanistan, there's more than 2,000 people died in an earthquake this week in a place that is just war-torn and full of oppression from people that don't have hope. And we want to pray hope back into both of those places right now. Can you join me? Father, we thank you that uh, Israel is close to your heart, super close to your heart. And we pray that, Father, that right now that the Christians that have begun to see movement and people coming to follow you, we pray that, that their hearts and their lives and the, and the hope of Jesus would penetrate the hearts and the lives of the people of Israel right now. We pray against death. We pray against destruction. We pray peace over Israel right now. We just say, Jesus, you are great. You are mighty. You are holy. You are the lion <laughs> and the lamb. And we just say, would you come and would you bring peace and hope and life to people who are desperate right now, who are afraid. And they would remember that their God has always provided. And so we just speak provision over them. We pray for Afghanistan right now that you protect lives of young people, just small children even alive being pulled out of rubble right now. We pray you protect lives right now and heal them and restore them in Jesus' name. Amen. We are picking up in part four in our series on perspective and we're glad that you're with us. If you haven't been with us, we'll give you a little bit of recap and try to get you caught up because we're gonna pick up where we left off last week. But uh, really perspective, and this has been driving our conversation, always determines what? So you guys haven't been here for the last four weeks. All right. Always determines our what? Our direction, our direction. And parents, you know this as much as anybody. You help your kids get a perspective and you hope that they walk in the right what? Direction. Now, I don't know about you, and I'll get to the rest of the recap here in just a quick second, but I don't know about you, but maybe you have this experience as a child, or you remember taking your kid to, anybody ever take a kid to preschool? It's tragic for the parents. The kids don't care. <clears throat> uh, but you remember that, that time as a kid, or maybe as you watched your kids go into class, and there was that one kid sitting at the table that had all the crayons. Yeah, maybe you were that kid. We'll get to that in just a second. And then you realize in the moment that you didn't have any. We call that awareness. And we'll get to that in just a second. But as soon as you were aware that you didn't have any, you wanted one. Oh, everybody goes, oh. But it's true because here's what we know, and this, will, this is gonna be kind of the theme that we walk around for the entirety of our time today, that awareness, awareness changes everything. It always has, and it always will. In the first week, we said this, that really not only is perspective determine our direction, that trust and confidence and perspective are the things that we've got to allow to be the pillars. We talked about principles are pillars that guide us through our journeys. And those principles and those pillars determine a couple of things. And those things really turn out to be things like this. Do we trust that God is who he said he would be? Do we have confidence that he is our provider? Now, we all like that idea, like, God is my provider, but I do the work for him. We think that way, don't we? 
We, you know, we're like, well, maybe I need to help God along in his provision for me. <laughs> but let's just say, do we trust that he's our provider? And then the third is that those things, those two things, if we get them right, should change our perspective. And that our perspective should be reoriented to because of the trust and the confidence. Now, we just said this, that he's after our heart and it's with your money where he'll start. He always is and always has been. And now half of you want to leave the room and that's okay. Everybody else at home can just click. click. But let me just say, here's why. Because we get offended because we think it's ours. And the first week we talked a lot about maybe that's poor language across the board. In fact, I was tempted in week one when we started this series to actually take our stuff and our money out of my language altogether because it gives us entitlement to something that has been given to us that doesn't belong to us. And so we said this, and the last part is this the treasure principle. Where your heart is, your treasure will also be. Is it him or is it us? So in this week two, we started talking about having a clear perspective, a clear perspective, and we got this, and we get this, that we, we know to say it, but we don't really know how to live it out, that everything comes from him, that it all belongs to him, and someday it will all go back to who? Yeah. To him. We like that idea. And we hate it all at the same time. Because that means those of us who are Jesus followers, we've got to be stewards back towards him. And what does he tell us? And this is where we jumped in last week. <clears throat> that we got to honor him with our stuff and our money. And then last week we just said this, that, and this is really kind of walking that right perspective. Um, really that keeping that good perspective means that we don't live in the red, we live in the black. Meaning this, we live within our means. We don't even, and this is where we kind of push you all to FPU. Sometimes we don't even know what our means are. We don't know where our dollars go. We don't know where they are. And that means we're poorly stewarding what belongs to him. And some 400 of you have jumped into FPU and I couldn't be more excited about that because it helps reshape how we see his stuff. Now, this week we're gonna pick up here that how do we keep the right perspective? We keep perspective, but what is the right perspective about what we have left when it's all said and done? And that means you're extra to which nobody in the room thinks they have any extra. Now I got really quiet, they're like, I don't have any extra. Is there magic to this? How does this work? No, no, there's obedience in this and then the extra is produced out of obedience. Let's talk about this for a quick second. I I wanna share a story with you. This is, um, I had to, I'm just gonna tell you in the front, I had to um, make this safe for a church to edit this story because I found it on the internet. So oh, don't act like you've never read anything. I thought, well, that'd be cool to tell in church, but you can't actually tell because all the language is in it. Come on. I said this, it says, this lady was saying, I was at the mall and I was walking from my car towards the entrance. As I was passing the designated parking spaces for people with disabilities, I saw a man approaching a woman who was getting out of her SUV. The man was loud and aggressive and he said, you can't park here. These spots are for the handicapped. She replied, I have a disabled permit, sir. He even got louder and said, that's total garbage. You can figure out where I changed the language. <clears throat> you have to have the handicapped person with you and able to park here. You can't just use it to get spots closer to the door. It's for people who need them. The woman calmly replied, sir, I have lung cancer. The disabled permit is mine. The guy said, I'm really sorry. I had no idea. Because the same thing is true for this guy that is for you and for me, that awareness changes everything. We're going to spend our time in Luke chapter 12, and I'd like for you to open in your Bibles there, but we're going to read one verse that we read two weeks ago or three weeks ago. It's out of Proverbs. You don't need to turn to it. It's going to pop up on the screen. I want you to read with me, but here's why. Because as we journey through this today... This idea that God has been generous towards us, that we could be a blessing towards others, is going to run through this whole theme of our entire conversation today. And what we become aware of is going to be a little hard for us to wrestle down. And I want us to pray this and (laughs) speak this over ourselves before we do this, because we're going to need his help to get through today. It says this, it's going to pop up on the screens all over the place. It says this in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Why don't you read with me? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Jesus, we need you to guide us, to steward us and help us end up where you want us to be today. Regardless of how we feel about this stuff, would you move on our hearts? 
regardless of where we walked into today with too much or not enough or however we see that stuff, that our hearts would be settled before you and we would be able to hear through the clutter and the lies of the things that would wanna speak louder than you today. We ask that you to guide us in Jesus' name. And everyone said. So really, seeing extra is a matter of perspective. We keep talking about perspective because just what we said, that perspective changes everything, that awareness influences our perspective, and that awareness gives us the ability to understand what's actually going on, not what we think is going on. Now, most of you don't think you're, you know, overwhelmingly aware, but have you ever thought about this? <clears throat> just for argument's sake, have you ever realized that you didn't care about the house you had until you saw somebody else's that was nicer? You didn't. As a kid, you loved the bike that you had until you realized that the neighbor kid had a nicer bike. And then you wanted it. I know some of us are a little more sophisticated than that. For you, maybe it's a car. You didn't know there was a problem with your car until you got into your friend's car who just got it, it looked, smelled new still, smelled new. Still had the paper plates on it. And you're like, oh. Maybe I'm missing out. And the fear of missing out just kind of sets in. And you know what that fear of missing out really is? It's a poor perspective. The poor perspective that you don't have enough because you don't have what they have. And that discontent drives us to make decisions that forfeit our ability to be generous towards God and generous towards others. Because listen, we say this around here all the time, you are blessed to be a blessing to others. And Jesus is constantly making this invitation to us. And I'm gonna set the stage here from the very beginning. If you're not a Jesus follower here today and you're just kind of trying to figure out what faith is about, let me just say this to you. If you live this way, your life will be better, okay? But you are not required to live this way. But if you do, your life will be better. If you are generous towards other people, your life will be better. It just every statistic on the planet says that generous people are generally happier than anybody else. You're clapping, but you're not gonna like this part. Jesus followers, <laughs> Listen, you don't have a right but not to obey. This is an option for us. This isn't like, hey, you know, by the time you take care of the college fund and you take care of your retirement, if you got some left over, maybe think about supporting the kids in Uganda. That's not how it starts. The only way with Jesus is to obey. And what we do about that requires us to reorient our life, our awareness about how we manage what he has entrusted to us. We're going to read a story about that in Luke chapter 12 in here in just a second. But um, somebody, and we got to go, you got your, that thing you carry around in your pocket, you got it right there? Just yeah, one of those. Yeah, can you just hold that up? You know what this is? This is an awareness device. This isn't a phone, it's an aware. I started to bring mine up here, but it's just inappropriate for me to have it up here. Because then people would see me and start texting me while I'm preaching. And this isn't a phone. This is a portal to poor awareness. <laughs> I joke because it's true. You know, before, now, believe it or not, I grew up without a cell phone. So I'm like that last generation that grew up without cell phones. I graduated from high school in the 90s, barely, but I did. I did, hey, listen, you know what? Just, Marvin, t can you guys edit this part? But I graduated in 1999 from high school, okay? So every high school dance, thank you, Prince, because we got a party like it's 19. Yep, okay, there you go. Now you know what every high school dance was like for me. But I didn't grow up with that. I didn't really grow up with the internet. The internet didn't become a thing until I was in college. But today, today, today we are constantly aware of what other people have and what we don't. And I just throw this out there. I think we're aware of what people want us to think they have, not what they actually have. Because for every blogger and influencer that's out there, you find out two thirds of them are living on a mattress in an apartment in some city they can't actually afford to be in. And yet the awareness that we think is being projected towards us, it's fake. It's a lie and we like it. We like it because it gives us the right to be greedy. And Jesus talks about a guy like that. 
in Luke chapter 12. This is in verse 13, it says this, and if you're open, you can follow along here really quick, but I just wanna introduce this idea because Jesus is teaching a group of people, and this is Luke, Luke, the guy that wrote Luke and Acts, Luke, who was not a disciple of Jesus, remember this, Luke comes along later and says, after investigating all these stories from the eyewitnesses, I found these to be the most compelling ones for those of you who might consider following Jesus. He said, these are the essential things that you have to know. And he starts writing, in fact, Luke is the only person that records this story in his gospel. And Jesus is talking to a group of people. <laughs> He's talking to a group of people that um, pay more taxes than you and I could ever imagine, who live under oppression and occupation and a ways them we'll never understand. And then what he says to these people about their generosity is powerful. In Luke 12, 13, there's a guy who interrupts Jesus and somewhere out from the crowd, he says, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. You know what he just said? Hey, teacher, leverage your religious power to get me what I want. Nobody has ever done that ever in the history of the church either, ever. I know if you're here and you're like not a Jesus follower, you're kind of rediscovering church, you're like, they're gonna make fun of themselves. We will make fun of ourselves till the cows come home, okay? Here's why, because we're broken people just like you. But here's what this guy, Luke highlights this guy's, <laughs> his greed. He wants what his brother has. And he said, hey teacher, <laughs> why don't you help me get mine? And Jesus' reply is interesting. We'll pick that up in just a second. But here's the thing. <clears throat> We all think what we have isn't enough. This is a human condition. And if we have a roof over our head and a car in the driveway, we have more than two thirds of the entire world. I'm not here to make you feel guilty today. That's not the point, that's the Holy Spirit. He's doing that, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not, listen, this isn't about feeling guilty. This is about us checking our heart about how we live towards God and others. And here's why, because nobody likes greedy people. Nobody does. Nobody moves into the person next door who's greedy and wants to steal from them and is like, I love my neighbor. Did you ever do that? Did you ever live like that person that was greedy at work that just kind of tried to rob every business deal, try to cut every corner, take a little bit of yours, take a little bit of theirs, take everybody's stuff because they wanted to make sure that they got ahead. You know what's funny about Jesus? He said, hey, listen, the only way is to obey. Anything other than that is losing. Losing in the kingdom perspective. The kingdom perspective says that you put others ahead of your self. <laughs> Here's the thing. Awareness has the power to change our perspective if we let it. And it will change our perspective. The question is, is what will it change? Will it change, and this is important, will it change our awareness of what we don't have or will it drive us towards the awareness of what we do have? Because there's a couple of principles here and we'll talk about them again as we close, but the realization of what we don't have, these are kind of three things that awareness can do. They can help us realize what we don't have, meaning envy, I don't have that car. I don't have that retirement. Envy, the first one. The second thing that realization and awareness can do, it can breed a realization of what we do have and make sure we keep it. We call that greed. And the third thing, or it can be the realization that what we have isn't ours, it never has been, it never will be, and it has always been his. The awareness will do one of those three things or a combination of the first two but the last one over, always will override the first two if we're willing to let it, always. See, um, awareness of what, other, what we do have should help us breed empathy for those that don't. And the awareness of what other people don't have should always drive our awareness of what we do have and force us towards gratitude and generosity. A few years ago, I got the chance to go to Kurdistan, which is the northern part of Iraq. And we went to some refugee camps that were um, the Yazidi people. If you know who the Yazidi people are, the Yazidi people are the, the tribe that actually ISIS targeted the most. In fact, they enslaved them, they destroyed their villages, they took their women and their children, they converted them, they destroyed their communities. 
In fact, to this day, they're still living in refugee camps even though ISIS has been decimated. Now, during that time, we went into the camps, and you guys can show those pictures. We got to see some of these kids and hang out with some of these kids. And the cool part about this is, if you've ever been in a refugee camp, you've ever been around the world, um, oh, by the way, heads, shoulders, knees, and toes works everywhere in the world. <laughs> and the thing you, know, you begin to understand is that kids are kids. And um, <clears throat> this little boy and the next little boy that you're going to see are holding little matchbox cars. One of them's an airplane or a helicopter and the other one is a car. And um, this isn't to, to help you, <laughs> to, to kind of highlight me. I wanna, I wanna help you understand something. When I got ready to go, I only took one little tiny carry-on suitcase. So I went to our son and I said, hey, by the way, buddy, I'm gonna go meet these kids that don't have toys like you. And he didn't know what to do with it. He was three. He did not know what to do with that. He said, kids don't have toys? Like he didn't understand that he's three and he lives in a, in a community where we have enough, more than enough, and he's got boxes full of matchbox cars. Like I step on them sometimes and I want to throw them away. And uh, at three, I said, hey bud, um, would you like to send some to these kids? Now granted, I didn't have another suitcase. I had like just this. So I said, you pick two. <laughs> You know what he did? Here's human nature, three years old. He went and found the two that he disliked the most to give them to me. <laughs> it's a true story. Can't make this stuff up. I said, hey, bud. Hey, bud, do you want somebody to give you the one that they don't want? He said, no. I said, why don't you find two you really like and make sure that they know that they're important because of what you do. So I took those pictures to show my kid, not to show you. They just happened to be on my phone. But here's what I wanted to show you. And what I want to highlight is this, is that, that what we do and how we do it, parents, influencers, people that have influence over others, what you do changes their awareness. Because my son wasn't aware that kids around the world, they hung on to those. They, play, they were playing with sticks in the dirt. They're in a refugee camp. There is no store. My, a contrary to popular belief, there isn't like, you know, click and order and it'll show up that day or the next day. That's what my kids think. Oh, we can just get another one, right? No, what we need to understand is that our awareness of other people's lack of should drive our awareness of what we do have. And my hope for him, and let me just tell you this, I didn't learn this in a vacuum. I didn't learn it in seminary. I didn't learn it in a book. I didn't learn it on a podcast. You know where I learned it? At home. Parents. We learn this stuff at home. We don't, I'd like to tell you you learn it at church. I hope you learn a little bit of it at church. But listen, you learn this stuff at home by the way the people that are influencing you live. So the real question that drives all this for us is what perspective orders our life and our finances? What you do with your time, what you do with your money. <clears throat> what we decide to do with that extra is an indicator of who or what controls our heart. I know you're probably like, I don't have extra. We'll talk about how we get extra in just a second. But let's talk about this in Luke chapter 12. This is verse 14. We're going to pick up that story where Jesus is reading to or sharing with those guys. Remember this guy blurts out, I've been a gathering smaller than this, but somebody stands up and goes, hey teacher, tell my, and he would have had authority because of being a rabbi to kind of speak truth towards these people. But Jesus just steps aside of that conversation and starts a whole nother conversation. He looks at the guy and says this in verse 14, friend, who made me judge over you to decide such things? You don't see Jesus step away from opportunities to correct behavior very often, but he does in this moment to, to speak to it directly, then jumps right into a story about what it means to be greedy, to live well, and to understand that you have more than enough. He goes on and says this, he says, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Luke tells us, then he told a story in verse 16. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops, to which us were like, that's great. They'll end up in the grocery store. We go pick them up. But this is different. This is an agricultural society. This is how you live. Your wealth is determined on how much you can produce. Now, we just think our wealth is dependent on how much we can get in a paycheck, right? These guys, how we live, how we eat, how we survive is how much we can grow. These are all agricultural people. Jesus is speaking their language. He's like, 
It's like the stock market. He's like, hey, look what this guy did. He tells us his whole story. He said to himself, this is the man, the rich man, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. To which all of us would say, that's a good problem to have. Think about it like this. It's, I made so much money this year, I can't leave all my money in one bank because it's not gonna be insurable. Some of you are like, that's a thing? It is a thing. <laughs> but listen, just for a second, I can't leave it all there. This is what he's saying. I got too much for one place. And he goes on, he says, and then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barn and build a bigger one. This would translate in our world to be like, you know what, forget that bank. I'm just gonna start my own, I have so much. Any of you have that problem? Oh, okay. And he said, I know, I'll tear it down and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have enough room to store all of my wheat and all of my goods. And then I'll sit back and say to myself, <laughs> my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. And you didn't know this came from scripture. Eat, drink, and be. <laughs> but God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night, then who will get everything you have worked for? See, the hard part about this is <clears throat> not a single person sitting there would have thought this guy was a fool. They would have thought he was blessed. So Jesus' idea of stewardship and kindness and generosity is colliding with their perspective on God's goodness towards people. But here's what we all know. Some of those wicked people in the world are the richest. And we have this conflicting idea that people with stuff are blessed. People with stuff can be blessed. Because here's what Jesus understood. You look at the word blessing, you know what the word actually means? To be holy. You didn't know that, did you? When someone was like, God, would you bless me? He's like, absolutely, I will make you holier. I would love for you to be holier. <laughs> you know what Jesus is really saying? The idea of this blessing and the idea of being blessed means becoming more like Jesus. I got bad news for you. Jesus didn't own anything. So sell everything. We're all gonna be married. We'll live in here together. I'm just kidding. No, no, look at Jesus is gonna give us some more instruction here in just a second. But what we gotta wrestle with is that following Jesus' way does not consist of an abundance of stuff. It exists in a posture of heart that understands that God has given to us that we might be givers to others, that we are blessed to be a blessing. Now watch this, you are being made holy, you are blessed. You are being made holy that you might be holiness towards other people. To which some of you, are, that terrifies you. You're like, I'm gonna turn into one of those crazy religious people. And Jesus said, no. No, no, the people that I, that I call that are obedient towards me, they're lovers of other people. They serve. I don't know if you caught this, and if you're watching this later, this might not be part of what you get to see, but Uche was just talking about, we go into the prisons and we care for the prisoners and we care for those who are in need, et cetera, et cetera. And some of us sitting in here right now, those of us who claim to follow Jesus think that guy in the prison just gets what he deserves. And that Jesus should quietly in our hearts and our moments when we're talking about being, being driven by generosity with our time and remember what Jesus said, that if you do it to the least of me, you've done it unto what? And he said, would you go to those who are, remember the sheep and the goats, this is a terrifying passage. You ever go read it, you just be scared. If you haven't read it, go read it. Jesus is dead face to people saying, hey, by the way, if you haven't visited people in prison and you didn't do these things, you haven't done it to me. But somehow we posture ourselves away from people like that because they made mistakes that we can see Well, we have ones that people never see. And Jesus is begging us, would you be made holy that you could help others live well? Blessed to be a blessing. See, how much time we spend considering 
what we can do with our stuff for ourselves instead of others should be an indicator of where our heart lies. Now, I don't know about you, confession, I scroll too. And I gotta tell you, I'm not scrolling through like, you know, searching things on, you know, certain shopping websites or searching through things, thinking, man, I wonder what I could take care of somebody else with this stuff with. Now I'm thinking about it, I was like, oh, I didn't know I could upgrade that thing. I didn't even know that existed. It's like suddenly I'm aware of something I don't have or something I don't need, but I convince myself that I need it. You ever do this? I catch myself all the time. Some friends of ours, we ride bikes together and we always have these conversations when we start a convo, I think I need a new bike. <laughs> it's like need is that thing that we tell ourselves to give ourselves permission to go do something we probably shouldn't do. Okay, I'm alone in that one. You've never told yourself you needed, I, I needed those new shoes. And then we couch it for emotional health. I'm just, I'm emotionally caring for myself. I just need, that's what I thought, okay. I just need, I just need it because need takes away the guilt, but the guilt still remains when the need is worn off and the, old, the new becomes old. This is why Jesus' constant invitation to people to follow him was about obedience over everything else. Because he said, hey, by the way, you can go do those things and you can try to fill that hole in your soul. But it ain't happened with stuff. I think in a place where we live and the way that we get to live, I know some of you don't feel like you're a privilege, but let me just say this, that we have a way, we have access to actually replace God with stuff. See, there are certain parts of the world where if you don't have God show up, you don't eat that day. In fact, what Uche didn't tell you is that you, out of your generosity as a church, regularly feed kids that are in a school inside of that refugee camp. You know why they feed them at school? Because they don't get to eat at home. You, Water of life. You regularly pay the salaries of those teachers so they can survive and care for their families while they live in a refugee camp and teach students who would never learn anything if it wasn't for you. You do that. But our awareness is so poor, right? Because we think, well, I can click on Instacart and I can have groceries in 45 minutes. And you think, that's just what everybody has. And Jesus is leaning across going, no, 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 this is what I have given. Would you be faithful with it towards others in the way I've been faithful towards you? With your extra. We haven't got to the extra part yet. We'll get there in just a second. But when we begin to process that we actually have extra, not because of anything that we've done, but because of what if he has given. Luke chapter 12, verse 21 <laughs> or excuse me, verse 20 said, but God said to him, you fool, you, this very day you will die. Who will own everything you have? Jesus saw being blessed being, is being made holy. And the problem is, is that wealth isn't a condition. Wealth isn't a status, isn't a place that you arrive to. Wealth is a perspective. Let me just help you understand something. If you were sitting in here, most likely if you were listening to this message, you have wealth beyond measure compared to the rest of the world. I know y'all hate me right now, it's okay. No, no, I, it is, because I'm offended just like you when someone preaches this at me, I'm like, mm, shut up man, come on. You don't have to make my student loan payments. Now listen, the fact that you have a student loan, <laughs> come on. Lean in here for me just for a second. Because if we don't get good perspective on this, we will miss the opportunity that is built into this. And the opportunity built into this is for our lives to have greater meaning and greater value because of what we leverage, I shouldn't say value, greater meaning and impact than what we could ever ask or imagine if we lean towards him and become generous in the way that he instructed us to be. So wealth isn't a condition, it's a perspective. Some of the wealthiest people I know have almost nothing. Because they are willing, listen, wealth is the indicator of, in God's eyes, wealth is the indicator of someone's willingness to give it away. You know, you know what's great? Some of the poorest people I know will give you everything that they have. I mean, I can't tell you the countless times I've gone overseas and someone's tried to give me something, I'm like, 
please no. They feed you in ways that they can't even eat themselves and they try to give you something they can never replace. And you just go, no, no, I don't need that. But you know what it is? It is an indicator of their heart to prioritize God and others over themselves. This is how we learn. This is why when Uche is standing up here going, you should get your kids, and, and Sola saying, you should get your kids into ministry and get them overseas. And we introduce our kids to outreach at two and eight. You know what they're saying is, change your kids' lives now, not later. Luke chapter 20, or 12, verse 21 goes on and says this, that this is how it will be with anyone who stores up for things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Jesus is telling us to be wise, but to be careful. It is not all for us. See, greed lives with the assumption that it is all for my consumption. Let me say that again. Greed lives with the mentality that it is all for my consumption. But generosity lives with the anticipation that the extra is often for others. That the extra is almost always for others. Um, a, a few months ago, a man and I had a cool story that isn't really important today, just to say that God made it really clear we were supposed to move. And I want to share this with you because it's an indicator of what happens at home being something that influences your legacy and what happens down the road. See, for us, the, the thing that really became the first question wasn't could we afford the house? That really wasn't the question for us. And we had four kids and we were living in a 1,200 square foot house and we just didn't like each other very much. So we need to figure that out. I'm kidding. She just didn't like me for good reason. Here's what I'm saying. Listen, God opened this door and we stepped through this door, but here, here was the question for us. It was never, can we afford to live here? The question was always for us, would this keep us from being generous? This isn't about what we can afford because you can leverage yourself and you can keep paying those bills, right? But the question is, does this decision compromise my ability to be generous towards God and generous towards others? Does it forfeit that thing that I know that God has called us for? And let me just tell you this, because I'm convinced, absolutely convinced through and through that I would have nothing if it wasn't for him. Not a thing. I know some of you are saying like, oh, you're smart. But I'm not that smart. I am not that wise. I am just convinced that it all comes from him. It all belongs to him. And I hope in my lifetime we get to give it all back to him. Now watch. You're cheering for me, but I didn't, I didn't teach myself this stuff. I didn't learn to be convinced that everything I have is because of him. I learned that at home. I learned that as a little kid when my parents would take me to orphanages and say, hey, by the way, you got new stuff for Christmas, so clean out your stuff. And you're like, no. And you're like, yeah. You know why? It was just that simple thing. Listen, parents, and this is, this is to honor my parents, just say this, if my, and you guys heard this from my dad last week, that my grandparents influenced him. Well, guess what? They pass it on. Here's, my parents always had extra, always. It just didn't, and I wanted it, let me tell you, I wanted it. And I was always mad that I didn't get it. I was always mad that I only got, you know, two pairs of shoes for the whole school year. And I was, but then, you know, and then missionaries come knocking or somebody needed my dad to go do ministry overseas. And there was always extra to do the stuff that had nothing to do with us. And I hated it, let me just tell you, I just hated it. You know why? Because I was, I lived in a community where everybody kind of had some stuff. And you know what that made me realize? I didn't have the same stuff. And I hated it. Because I wanted the extra for me. I mean, come on. Don't act like you're not like me. I wanted it for me. And as time went on, like I said, it's not because I'm smart or because I'm wise. You watch the fruit. You watch the byproduct of those decisions that we parents make setting the stage, that we grandparents make setting the stage for our kids about being generous towards God and generous towards others and putting ourselves in second place. And you watch the fruit of that and you see what happens. Listen. I learned it at home, I didn't learn it in seminary, I didn't learn it in a book, I didn't learn it on the internet, and I didn't learn it from a podcast. 
I learned it because I was caught, not taught. And parents, we have to live this way. Jesus followers, we have to live this way. Jesus' way is the only way and it always calls us to obey. And when we do, when we do, you can cheer for Jesus, just remember he's telling you to obey, okay. And when you do, and when we do, and when we get this right, the world around us is a better place and the people look at us and go, we need to be more like them. But I don't feel like people feel that way these days. How do we leverage that and begin to say, hey, we're generous, and, and this is why I try to tell you guys and celebrate your generosity when I tell you you're feeding those kids and you're, you're, you're employing those teachers for them. You. Here, here's what, I, what we don't talk about enough. That the church in America is the most generous group of people in the entire world. Christian organizations give away more money from America than any other place combined throughout the entire world. The philanthropy that happens to the American church is there, but here's the thing. We forget that it's all his, and we do it in our name instead of his. We gotta make that right. So here's the last couple things. Jesus says this is the way that it is. And the thing is, will we be faithful to preserve the good things that he has given us? If this all comes from him, it says he's the father and he gives good gifts, right? This is what Jesus teaches us. Will we be faithful to preserve the good things that he has given us as good? Or will we corrupt the good things through our own greed, our own envy, and our own jealousy? So how do we have extra? This is the tricky question. Here's how we have extra. We live with less. We live with less. I know you weren't, I thought you, you were thought, man, there's gonna be some magic formula. There's not. It's what Jesus said, deny yourself, live with less. Because the only way is to obey. I said this at the beginning, I'll say this as we close. When, if you're here and you're not a Jesus follower, living this way will make your life better and make the world around you a better place. But Jesus followers, there's no option but to obey for us. There's just not, there's no way, I can't really sugarcoat this one, I'm sorry, I wish I could. But I gotta stand here and just tell you this, the word that Jesus has for us is simply this, that my way is to always obey. And Jesus said, just put me and others first. Put me and others first and I will meet you in the rest. Because I've been a good father and provided in ways you haven't considered. And would you trust my way above yours? Jesus goes on and Verse 33, a little farther down, he gives us kind of a game plan. <laughs> Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasures for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven will never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there your desires over your heart will also, what? Be. So, this is my take. I think Jesus is telling people to sell stuff because sometimes it's easy to give away dollars but hard to give away stuff. Some of you have more than enough. You can give lots of dollars away. You can give huge percentage of income away and it doesn't impact your life. You know what does impact our life? Taking something that we see as our own and selling it and giving it away. You know what that does? It breaks our greed. I don't think Jesus was just saying, hey, go get some more dollars by having a yard sale. I think Jesus was saying, break your own attachment to the things that don't belong to you anyway. Whew, that's rough. That's hard. Because we've developed an emotional attachment and dependency on things ahead of him. We've all done it. We've all done it. So, here's our challenge for this week. Predetermine you're gonna be, your, you and your family are gonna be generous towards God. Just predetermine it. Because if you don't predetermine it, it will never happen. Because if you tell yourself, I'm gonna be generous towards God and others as soon as, as soon as I have more, you will just find a way to not have more. You'll have more, you'll just spend it. You with me here? 
You gotta predetermine. And here's the second thing. The Bible is always really clear. Scripture is always clear about percentage giving. Not about a number. Not about a number of your income. A percentage of your giving. 10% is to tithe. And here's what I'm just gonna say to you. Those of you who are being faithful towards Jesus, he's gonna t- ask you to do something else. Above and beyond so he can meet you in those circumstances and say, look what I did. And then when someone like Uche walks up on the stage, you go, look what you did, God. Because quietly, somewhere deep in your heart, you're gonna know that you put dollars that you should have never been able to put towards something that you should have never had a heart for, but God changed your heart and you followed the way to obey. And you changed the world because of it. So here's, here's the hard part though. But the hard part is like, that sounds like a lot of self-will and determination, doesn't it? It's surrender and it's obedience, but... God isn't interested in our stuff. He wants to rule our hearts. What is this? We said that in the first week. Let me say this as we close. Paul tells us that none of this is possible without the power and the presence of the Spirit in us. He says this in Ephesians chapter three. He says in verse 14, when I think of all this, he's thinking about Jesus' sacrifice and his life for us. I fall on my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything, and heaven and on earth. And I pray from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow deep, deep into God's love and keep you strong. And he finishes verse 20 and says, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power to work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all the generations forever and ever, amen. So would you stand with me? Here's, here's the tricky part is we can try to will ourselves to do things like this. We can go home and write notes on our mirrors or put sticky notes on our cars, be generous, save, cut back on spending, you know, delete your purchasing accounts. Online. You can do lots of things. But they will always come up short if we don't surrender towards Jesus. And surrendering towards Jesus opens up to the possibility of letting the power and the presence of the Spirit to fill you, empower you, and transform you and the world around you. And I'm going to pray that over you as you go today. Father, I pray over us that we would lean towards you and in leaning towards you, Jesus, the only way is to obey and that we would obey towards you. And in our obedience, you would do the gracious thing that you promised, Spirit, that you would come, you would fill us, that you would anoint us with your presence to change the world around us, but you started with changing in us first. So we stop and just say, have your way in us. Would you move us? Would you shape us? Would you transform us? And then would we just recognize that we are weak and unable without your power. We are weak and unable without your power. And that power is the spirit. The spirit of heaven that would come and fill people, fill us. Some of us, Holy Spirit, have never surrendered to you. We followed Jesus for a long time, but we've never surrendered towards you to give you control over our hearts, to let you speak to our hearts and our minds. And would you take us and make us people that are sensitive to you, that we'd be soft towards you, and that we recognize our sensitivity towards your spirit starts with our sensitivity towards others. And then you show up and you meet us in that. So Jesus, no matter where we are in this journey, would you show up, would you meet us today? Would you fill us with your presence? And it's your precious and matchless name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Our ministry team will be up here to pray with you guys. If you need prayer, please don't go home. Otherwise, God bless you guys. Have a great week and we'll see you soon. Well, wasn't that a great message? You know, I say this all the time, but our hope here is that you wouldn't just receive information, but that you would experience transformation. And so we hope that you were transformed and challenged and encouraged by today's message. Like we mentioned, if you want to find out more ways to get connected to Water of Life, make sure you check out our website, wateroflifecc.org. But other than that, we love you guys. We hope you have a great week, and we can't wait to see you next week at Water of Life.